The 6,555th Aerospace Test Group is an inactive United States Air Force unit. It was last assigned to the Eastern Space and Missile Center and stationed at Patrick AFB, Florida. It was inactivated on 1 October 1990. Prior to the activation of the Air Force Space Command, the unit was responsible for the development of USAF missiles, both tactical surface-to-surface, CIM-10 Bamak interceptor, SM-62 Snark intercontinental cruise missile, intercontinental ballistic missile and heavy launch rockets used for military for satellite deployment. The unit played a key role in the civilian NASA Project Mercury, Project Gemini and Project Apollo manned space programs along with military space shuttle flights. The mission of the unit today is performed by the 45th Space Wing no direct lineage. Topic history Activated in December 1950, replacing 550th Guided Missiles Wing, the 6555th had a distinguished career launching and or managing ballistic missiles, space launch vehicles and payloads for the Ballistic Systems Division, the Space Systems Division and the Space and Missile Systems Organization. As a wing or a group, the 6,555th earned 10 Air Force Outstanding Unit Awards between 21 December 1959 and October 1990. In the 1950s, the unit had several designation changes and organizational realignments. As launches of winged missiles continued, the wing gained two new units the 1st and 69th Pilotless Bomber Squadrons in October 1951 and January 1952. Thereafter, the 6,555th focused most of its efforts on assembling, testing and launching B-61 Matador missiles so the 1st and 69th pilotless bomber squadrons would be prepared for operations in Europe. The 6,555th Guided Missile Wing became the 6,555th Guided Missile Group on 1 March 1953, and the 1st and 69th Pilotless Bomber Squadrons were reassigned to Tactical Air Command on 15 January 1954. Since TAC agreed to train all other B-61 Matador squadrons at TAC Zone School at Orlando AFB, Florida, the 6,555th Guided Missile Group was little more than a squadron when the 69th completed its field training in the summer of 1954. The 6,555th Guided Missile Group was discontinued on 7 September 1954. The 6,555th Guided Missile Squadron was allowed to survive as a B-61 Matador Research and Development Testing Unit, and it was reassigned to AFMTC headquarters on 7 September 1954. The 6,555th Guided Missile Squadron became the 6,555th Guided Missile Group Test and Evaluation on 15 August 1959, and it was reassigned to the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division without any change of station on 21 December 1959. Concurrent with its reassignment, the group picked up the resources of the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division's Assistant Commander for Missile Tests. At the beginning of 1971, the 6,555th Aerospace Test Group consisted of a commander's office and three divisions, e.g., Support, Atlas Systems, and Titan III Systems. Though the test group's launch operations revolved around the Atlas and Titan III systems divisions in the early 1970s, the group established its Space Transportation System (STS) division on the 1st of July 1974 to ensure the Defense Department's shuttle requirements were factored into future shuttle operations at the Kennedy Space Center (KSC). On the 1st of November 1975, the test group reorganized its Atlas and Titan III launch vehicle agencies under a new division. Division, the Space Launch Vehicle Systems Division. On the same date, the Atlas Satellite Launch Systems Branch and the Titan III Space Satellite Systems Launch Operations Branch were consolidated under the newly created Satellite Systems Division. The changes were directed by the 6,595th Aerospace Test Wing Commander to combine booster operations under one division chief and payload operations under another division chief. In the same vein, the IUS Operations Branch was placed under the Space Launch Vehicle Systems Division when that branch was formed on 1 July 1977. 
Following the final Atlas Agena launch on 6 April 1978, the Space Launch Vehicle Systems Division and the Satellite Systems Division shifted their respective attentions from Atlas Agena operations on Complex 13 to Atlas Centaur boosters and payloads designated for Defense Department missions on Complex 36. On 1 October 1979, the group was transferred to the 45th Space Wing's immediate predecessor, the Eastern Space and Missile Center. ESMC. The unit was inactivated on 1 October 1990 when Air Force Space Command inactivated the provisional unit and merged the organization with ESMC. Most of the 6,555 THS resources were reorganized as the 1st Space Launch Squadron under ESMC and two combined task forces CTFs, serving AFSPC and Air Force Systems Command. Ultimately, the last vestiges of the 6,555th were inactivated on 1 July 1992 as Air Force Systems Command and Air Force Logistics Command merged to form Air Force Materiel Command. Today, the mission of the unit is performed by the 45th Operations Group and the 45th Launch Group components of the 45th Space Wing. Topic. Weapons and missile development Topic. Post war era Between 1946 and 1950, the group's predecessor units, the 1st Experimental Guided Missiles Group and 550th Guided Missiles Wing, tested a variety of glided bombs and tactical missiles. They also developed QB-17 drone aircraft for use in atomic bomb testing, and later as targets for anti-aircraft missiles. The 550th GMW also launched the first rockets from the Joint Long Range Proving Ground at Cape Canaveral, Florida in 1950. Republic 4 JB-2 The JB-2 was a U.S.-made copy of the famous German V-1 surface-to-surface, pilotless flying bomb first used against England in June 1944. Planned for use in the invasion of Japan, the missile was never used in combat during World War II. The first experimental guided missiles group began a testing program with the JB-2 at White Sands, New Mexico in March 1947 and it spent several months preparing a detachment to depart for cold weather testing of the JB-2 in Alaska in November 1948. Testing was also done at the Army Air Forces Proving Ground at Santa Rosa Island, Florida. The JB-2 was never used operationally, however it led to the development of the first operational USAF cruise missile, the Martin B-61A Matador, QB-17L Flying Fortress 1946-1950, the BQ-17 Flying Fortresses was as unmanned aircraft that would fly near or even through mushroom clouds during post-war atomic tests, B-17s were withdrawn from stores for conversion into drones with the addition of radio, radar, television, and other equipment. Equipment. Most of the work was performed by the San Antonio Air Depot at Kelly Field in Texas. Initially supplied by the first experimental guided missiles group, the first of these nuclear tests took place in the South Pacific under the code name Operation Crossroads. When the USAF was established in 1947, the director aircraft became DB-17 gigaseconds, while the drones became QB-17GL. By January 1950, the Air Proving Ground decided this piecemeal operation ought to be consolidated, and it recommended the establishment of a separate and permanent drone squadron. Personnel from the 550th GMW-2D Guided Missile Squadron were subsequently transferred to a new unit, the 3200th Proof Test Group in May 1950. When the 550th GMW was reassigned to Patrick AFB in December 1950, the drone operations remained at the Eglins Air Proving Ground Center, VB-6 Felix The Felix was an air-to-surface guided bomb equipped with a heat-seeking guidance system primarily designed as an anti-ship weapon. Developed during World War II, successful trials led to the Felix being put in production in 1945, but the Pacific War ended before it entered combat. 
Testing on the weapon was conducted between 1947–1948 at Eglin Field by the first experimental guided missiles SQUADRONV B-3 Razan The VB-3 Razan for range and azimuth was a standard 1,000-pound general-purpose bomb fitted with flight control surfaces. Development of the Razan began in 1942, but it did not see use during World War II. Tested during the post war era by the 1st Experimental Guided Missile Squadron at Eglin Field, the Razan was used by the 19th Bombardment Group B 29s during the Korean War, the first in August 1950. The squadron dropped 489 Razans, and about one third of those dropped did not respond to radio control. Despite these difficulties, B-29 bombardiers destroyed 15 bridges with Razan bombs. VB-13 Tarzan (1947–1948) developed in 1946. The Tarzan was essentially a British 12,000-pound tall boy bomb fitted with a forward shroud to provide lift, with flight control surfaces in the tail. The name came from a combination of Tall Boy and Razan, tested during the post-war era, by the 1st Experimental Guided Missile Squadron, at Eglin Field. The first Tarzan attack in Korea took place in December 1950, and by the end of January, 19th Bombardment Group B-29s had cut spans out of four bridges. Tarzans remained in short supply, however, and after a B-29 was believed lost attempting to jettison one, the Air Force cancelled the Tarzan in August 1951. Thirty were dropped, one hit their targets, destroying six bridges and damaging another. Lark missile, 1949-1953, development began in 1944. The Lark was an early United States Navy surface-to-air, liquid-propellant, rocket-propelled missile built by the Consolidated Balti Aircraft Corporation, and was usually launched from the decks of ships with the help of solid propellant boosters. It carried a 100-pound warhead and had a range of about 38 miles. Also tested by the Air Force 550th GMW 3D Guided Missile Squadron at Navy Point Mugu Testing Range, California. Also tested by the 4800th GMW 4803D GMS at the Long Range Proving Ground, Florida, German B 2 WAC Corporal. 1950, most tests of captured B 2 rockets were conducted at White Sands, New Mexico, however, the Bumper 7 and Bumper 8. Tests were launched from Cape Canaveral on 24 and 29 July 1950 respectively. The General Electric Company was responsible for launching the vehicles, and the Army's Ballistic Research Laboratories Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland provided instrumentation support. Among the Army and Air Force units that supported the bumper flights from the Cape, the 550th Guided Missiles Wing provided several aircraft and crews to monitor the range for clearance purposes. The Long Range Proving Ground Division provided overall coordination and range clearance. AIM 4 Falcon 1952 The Falcon was the first operational guided air to air missile of the U.S. Air Force. The missile was developed through a series of prototypes, e.g., models. A through F. On the 31st of March 1952, the 6,556th Guided Missile Squadron established a Falcon cadre at Holloman Air Force Base, and Falcon Model C and D missiles were fired against bomber drones during 1952. Gam-63 Rascal, 1951–1952. The Gam-63 was an air-to-surface supersonic guided missile armed with a nuclear warhead. Its development was inaugurated in April 1946. The Rascal was intended as a standoff weapon, to be launched from Strategic Air Command SAC bombers as far away as 100 miles, thus reducing the manned bomber crew's exposure to enemy defenses in the immediate target area. A two thirds scale version of the GAM 63 Rascal called Shrike was tested at Holloman AFB in 1951 and 1952 by the 6,556th Guided Missile Squadron to evaluate the aerodynamics and launching characteristics of the Rascal system. Though there was some thought given to transferring the Rascal program to the Patrick AFB Air Force Missile and Testing Center in 1952, Headquarters ARDC decided to keep the Rascal at Holloman AFB along with shorter-ranged missile programs. Topic. Aerodynamic missiles 
See also 4504th Missile Training Wing Aerodynamic or winged missile testing dominated the activities of the 6555th for most of the 1950s. The decade witnessed the introduction of the B-61 Matador, SM-62 Snark, IM-99 Bamark, XSM-64 Navajo and trademark 76 MACE aerodynamic missiles, among which the Matador, with over 280 launches to its credit, stood out as the most launched missile of its era. The Matador was also the 6,555th's first full-fledged weapon system program and its initial deployment overseas included military launch crews trained at Cape Canaveral AFS. B-61A Matador, 1951–1954 The Matador was a surface-to-surface -surface tactical missile designed to carry a conventional or nuclear warhead. Originally designated as the B-61, the USAF's first pilotless bomber. It was similar in concept to the German V-1 buzz bomb of World War II, and developed from the United States JB-2 copy of the V-1. The XB-61 was first launched on 19 January 1949. Operational trademark 61s, which later followed, were the first tactical guided missiles in the USAF inventory. The first pilotless bomber squadron light, was organized in October 1951 for test and training purposes. 286 operational trademark 61 Matador missiles were test-fired from Cape Canaveral, the first on 20 September 1951, the last on 1 June 1961, SM-62 Snark 1952-1959, the SM-62 Strategic Missile Program gave the U.S. Air Force valuable experience in developing long-range strategic nuclear missile systems. The SM-62 was a significant forerunner of cruise missiles developed many years later. The wing received its first SNARK training missile, e.g., an N-25 research vehicle, in late May 1952, and the 6,556th Guided Missile Squadron activated a SNARK cadre at AFMTC on 16 June. The squadron conducted 97 test launches at the Cape beginning on 29 August 1952 through 5 December 1960 from LC-1, LC-2 and LC-4 for the SNARK Employment and Suitability Test e and Saint, program. There were several mishaps during the test program, though they were valuable learning experiences, caused some to label Florida's coast as SNARK-infested waters. On 27 June 1958, Strategic Air Command's SAC 556th Strategic Missile Squadron launched its first SNARK an N69E, under the supervision of the 6,555th GMS from LC-2. Under an informal agreement between Air Training Command and AFMTC, one officer and five airmen were sent to AFMTC in March 1959 and attached to the 6,555th GMS to train officers and airmen for SAC SNARK unit at Presque Isle AFB, Maine, IM-99 Bamark The supersonic Bamark missiles IM-99A and IM-99B were the world's first long-range anti-aircraft missiles, and the only surface-to-air missile SAM ever deployed by the United States Air Force. Unlike the LARC missile program, the IM-99 Bamark test program at the Cape was essentially a Boeing contractor-led operation. The 6,555th's people were not responsible for any IM-99 Bamark launches, but six airmen from the 6,555th's 20-man IM-99 Bamark section were assigned to help Boeing with electronic equipment maintenance tasks in late March 1953, and nine other airmen assisted the University of Michigan with its IM-99 Bamark activities at the Cape. The Air Force Missile Test Center provided range support and test facilities at the Cape, and AFMTC's safety agencies were responsible for ensuring that safety requirements for the 15,000-pound, 47-foot-long missile were stringently enforced. Launch pads 3 and LC-4 were used for IM-99 testing. In relation to other aerodynamic missile programs at the Cape, the IM-99 Bamark continued to move ahead slowly. The first Bamark launch took place on 10 September 1952, however by the middle of 1956, only eight propulsion test vehicles, nine ramjet test vehicles and five guidance test vehicles had been launched. 
Two tactical prototype BOMARCs were launched against a QB-17 Flying Fortress target drone in October and November 1956, but the 6,555 THS people only played a supporting role in those tests and later contractor-led operations. 25 Bamark interceptor missiles were launched from the Cape before ARDC announced plans in September 1958 to transfer the Bamark program from Cape Canaveral to the Air Proving Ground Center's Eglin AFB test site at Santa Rosa Island near Fort Walton Beach, Florida. The last Bamark launch took place on the 3rd of September 1958, trademark 76 Mace 1956 to 1962, a replacement for the TM61A Matador. The Mace was a tactical surface surface launch missile designed to destroy ground targets. Development of the MACE began in 1954, and the first test firing occurred in 1956. Testing was conducted from hardsight pads 21 and 22. The first version of the MACE, the A, employed a terrain matching radar guidance system known as ATRAN automatic terrain recognition and navigation which matched the return from a radar scanning antenna was matched with a series of onboard radar terrain maps the Mace B was an improved version of the Mace A the B61A Matador's immediate successor and used an inertial guidance system manufactured by the AC Spark Plug Company the guidance system corrected the flight path if it deviated from the maps the 6,555th Guided Missile Squadron performed testing on the MACE beginning in 1956 with its first successful test firing. The division was phased out subsequently, and the MACE Weapons Branch composed of five senior civil service engineers and 14 airmen was established on 10 July 1961 to provide instrumentation support and engineering evaluation for 16 MACE Bs launched by Tactical Air Command's 4504th Missile Training Wing. The MACE Weapons Branch was dissolved at the conclusion of the MACE Category 3 Systems Operational Testing and Evaluation program in April 1962. X-10, XSM-64 Navajo The North American B-64 Navajo was designed as an interim strategic weapon to be used while the first-generation intercontinental ballistic missiles were being perfected. The basic concept of the Navajo program called for the weapon to be lofted to high altitude using a conventional strap-on rocket booster. Since the XB-64 later redesignated XSM-64 was powered by ramjets, the engines were started after launch when sufficient speed required for ramjet operation was reached at approximately 50,000 feet. The 6,555th Guided Missile Squadron launched 15 Navajos during the test program between 1955 and 1958. Only two of three planned versions e.g., the X-10 and the XSM-64 were ever launched at the Cape from LC-9 and LC-10. After six months of delays, the first X-10 flight took place 19 August 1955. On the XSM-64's first launch on 6 November 1956, the pitch gyro failed 10 seconds after lift-off, and the missile and its booster broke up and exploded 26 seconds into the flight. Three more XSM-64s were launched over the next seven months with depressing, if not equally dismal, results. The next missile fell back on the launch pad on 25 April after rising only four feet. The last of the three was launched on 26 June 1957. It performed well until the ramjets failed to operate after booster separation, and the missile impacted about 42 miles downrange. The only bright spots in the program seemed to be some static tests of the Navajo's booster rockets and North Americans' isolation of problem areas revealed in the first four XSM-64 flights. Unfortunately for North American, Navajo was already doomed. In a message dated 12 July 1957, Air Force headquarters terminated the Navajo's development. Topic. Ballistic missiles The Air Force Ballistic Missile Program had its origins in studies and projects initiated by the Army Air Corps immediately after World War II. Faced with growing evidence of the Soviet Union's development of thermonuclear weapons and ballistic missile technology in 1953, the Air Force established the Western Development Division in Los Angeles to carry out that task. 
PGM-174 The Douglas SM-75, PGM-17A Thor was the first operational USAF ballistic missile. Thor was designed to be an interim nuclear deterrent while the U.S. Air Force developed long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles ICBMs as a top national priority. The Air Force Missile Test Center became involved with the Thor weapon system 315A program in the fall of 1954, after ARDC ordered development of that missile, as soon as possible. Following a series of meetings between AFMTC and Western Development Division officials in February and March 1955, support requirements were worked out for two launch pads, a blockhouse, a guidance site, one service stand, airborne guidance test equipment, housing and messing facilities. The Air Force Ballistic Missile Division carried out the first test launch from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 17B LC-17B on the 25th of January 1957. The first launch by a USAF SAC missile crew was made on 16 December 1958. Training turned over to Vandenberg AFB, 1959 for further testing and deployment to Great Britain and other locations in NATO. Still in use today, the Thor booster is used as the first stage of a space vehicle known as the Delta II used for Global Positioning Satellite GPS and commercial space launch operations. SM-65 Atlas (1957–1965). The SM-65 Atlas missile was developed by General Dynamics Convair Division for the U.S. Air Force. It was the first operational intercontinental ballistic missile in America's nuclear arsenal and the beginning of the United States space program. The Atlas development was a much larger enterprise than the Thor program, but its flight test program moved ahead quickly once the missile arrived at the Cape. The first XSM-16A Atlas prototype tested from Launch Pad 12 on of June 1957. Following completion of the XSM-16A flight test program in March, Convair proceeded with the SM-65A Atlas development program, which was scheduled to advance through four series of flight tests by the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division, Series A, airframe and propulsion tests, employing seven 181,000-pound test missiles between June and the end of December 1957. The first Series A SM-65A test missile was launched from Pad 14 on of June 1957, and was completed on 3 June 1958 from Pad 12, Series B, booster separation and propulsion tests, employing three 248,000-pound test missiles between January and the end of March 1958. The first Series B Atlas SM65B was launched from a third site, Launch Pad 11, on the 19th of July 1958, the last on the 2nd of April 1959 from Pad 11, although Pads 13 and 14 were also used in this testing phase. Series C guidance and nose cone tests, employing 18 243,000 pound test missiles between April and the end of November 1958. The first Series C SM65C missile was launched successfully from Pad 12 on the 23rd of December 1958. The last Series C mission launched from Pad 12 on the 24th of August 1959 ended on a high note when the missile's nose cone was recovered 5000 miles downrange. Series D operational tests of Atlas prototype IE the complete missile employing 24 243000 pound Atlas prototypes. The first Series D SM65D missile was launched from Pad 13 on the 14th of April 1959. The Air Force accepted the Atlas on the 1st of September 1959 and SAC Commander Thomas S. Power declared the missile operational. About a week later, the entire Atlas ICBM program was moved to Vandenberg AFB as Weapon System 107A1 in 1959. Under continued pressure from an apparent missile gap between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the U.S. Air Force moved quickly to activate the Atlas. Months before the D series proved itself at the Cape, the first operational Atlas launch complex was completed at Vandenberg and Atlas D 
Missiles was put on alert at Vandenberg's Complex 576A shortly thereafter SAC announced the missile as operational. At the beginning of 1960, airmen assigned to the Atlas Operations Division were working for Convair on Atlas ground and flight tests as part of the 6,555 THs on the job training program. As this individual training continued, Convair launched 18 Atlas D and six SM-65E Atlas test missiles from the Cape between 6 January 1960 and 25 March 1961. Following the 6,555th's internal reorganization on 17 April 1961, the Atlas Project Division was divided into the Atlas Weapons Branch and the Atlas Booster Branch. The Atlas Operations Division was integrated into the Atlas Weapons Division as one of three sections e.g., systems, requirements, and operations. By 1 June, three operations section personnel were working at ARMA's guidance laboratory, and the rest of the section's airmen had replaced contractor technicians at Complex 11 to turn that facility into military operation. Though that transformation was not completed in 1961, the operations section participated in five Atlas launches from Complex 11 in the last half of 1961, and airmen, technicians completed most of the checkout and launch items required on two of those flights. A total of 15 SM-65E and 4 SM-65F Atlas series missiles were launched from complexes 11 and 13 during 1961. The Atlas ICBM remained on alert over the next five years. All three Atlas series were phased out between May 1964 and March 1965 as part of a general retirement of the nation's first-generation Atlas and Titan I ICBMs. Like the Thor, the Atlas booster was mated to a variety of high-energy upper stages over the next quarter century, and remains an important part of the U.S. space program, HGM-25A Titan I the Titan I Weapon System 107A2 program was pursued initially as insurance against the SM-65 Atlas possible failure, but it enjoyed many technological refinements that had been deliberately left out of the Atlas to avoid delays in the Atlas deployment. The Titan I was also known as the XSM-68 Experimental Strategic Missile 68 while it was under development. The Titan I flight test program was divided into Series 1, 2 and 3. Twelve flights were programmed for each of the first two series, and 45 Series 3 flights were anticipated to complete the program. To save time, Series 1 and 2 tests would be run concurrently with considerable overlap in the flights. The Titan I assembly buildings were ready for functional tests by the summer of 1958, and the contractor shifted to around-the-clock operations in September to get the first Titan I complex LC-15 ready for use by the end of November 1958. Launch Complex 16 was almost finished by the end of the year, and launch complexes 19 and 20 were finished in 1959. The first Titan I arrived at Cape Canaveral on 19 November 1958. The 6,555th Test Wing development had separate project test divisions and operations divisions for the Titan I project. The project divisions were grouped under the Director of Tests, who exercised on-the-spot technical supervision of contractor-conducted missile tests. The operations divisions were organized under the Director of Operations, who was charged with providing a USAF-capable launch capability for missile and space programs. Under the 6,555th's Director of Support, there were other divisions for engineering, instrumentation, plans and requirements, facilities, materiel and inspection. Those divisions provided an Air Force test and evaluation capability for missiles and space vehicles. The Titan Project Division had jurisdiction over four Titan launch complexes 15, 16, 19 and 20, a radio guidance site and laboratory, an all-inertial guidance lab, hangars T and U, and a re-entry vehicle hangars. These I flights were designed to test the Titan's first stage and explore the problem of starting the second stage's rocket engine at altitude. 
The first four Titanite test missiles were launched from Complex 15 on the 6th of February, the 25th of February, the 3rd of April, and the 4th of May 1959 on Series 2 flights. The second stage's guidance system was operated in conjunction with the Titan's control system, and those flights served the additional purpose of testing the Titan's nose cone separation mechanism. Series 2 was begun with a launch the 14th of August 1959 from LC19. It was completed with a test launch from LC-16 on 27 May 1960 Series 3 flights validated the performance of the Titan I production prototype. Series 3 test launches began on 24 June 1960 from LC-15, the 6555th also began developing a military launch capability for the Titan I ballistic missile program at the Cape in 1959. By the spring of 1960, the Titan Operations Division had completed about 50% of the training needed to form an all-military Titan launch crew, and many of its airmen were working with the Martin Company as members of the contractor's Titan firing teams. The last Titan I test launch was performed from LC-20 on 20 December 1960, and the project was turned over to Vandenberg AFB for operational deployment. The Titan I was first American ICBM based in underground silos, being deployed and made operational in April 1961. Though the Titan I was operational for only three years, it was an important step in building the Air Force's strategic nuclear forces. LGM 25C Titan II, while the SM 68A Titan I system was becoming operational, the USAF recognized that it could be simplified and improved. Using the same manufacturing and test facilities, the SM-68B took shape as a major step forward in ICBM technology. Perhaps Titan II's most important feature was its quick launch capability. It could be launched in about 60 seconds from inside its underground silo Titan I took 15 minutes and had to be elevated above ground first. This speed was crucial in responding to a preemptive nuclear attack before incoming missiles arrived. Almost immediately after the release of the Titan I from the R&D testing program, the Titan division began R&D testing on the follow-on LGM-25C Titan II. The section's people received two months of formal training at Martin's Titan plant in Denver during the first half of 1962, and they continued their on-the-job training at Cape Canaveral. Launch complexes 15 and 16 were modified to launch the new missile, and the first test flight of the Titan II was made on 16 March 1962 from LC-15. Two more successful test flights were made from complexes 15 and 16 on the 6th of July and the 7th of November. The operations branch's participation in Titan II launches remained somewhat limited during this period, but its involvement increased significantly during three test flights on the 12th of September, the 26th of October, and the 19th of December 1962. Finally, on 6 February 1963, the Titan Weapons Division recorded its first USAF crew launch of the Titan II. The Operations Branch's second shift launch crew completed their Titan II training on 21 August 1963 with a highly successful test flight from Complex 15. Four more Titan II test flights were launched from Complex 15 in 1964 before the missile's R&D program was concluded at Cape Canaveral. Two of the flights, which were launched on 15 January and 26 February 1964, met some of the test objectives. The other two test flights, on 23 March and 9 April 1964, met all of their objectives. Upon completion of testing on 30 June 1964, the Titan Weapons Division was discontinued and its personnel were reassigned to other divisions, LGM-30 Minuteman 1959-1970, Boeing LGM-30A Minuteman IA Boeing LGM-30A Minuteman IA missiles were the first generation of a revolutionary new family of ICBMs. They used solid rather than liquid fuel, and so could be launched in less than a minute, hence the Minuteman name, referring to colonial American farmers who could be ready to defend their homes at a moment's notice. In contrast to Minuteman, older missiles like Atlas and Titan I took up to half an hour to fuel and launch. They were also complex and costly, requiring close monitoring and constant maintenance, and the propellants could be dangerous. 
Moreover, they tended to be vulnerable to attack. Minuteman missile testing was the last intercontinental ballistic missile effort at Cape Canaveral. The 6,555th Test Wing Minuteman activities began on 21 December 1959 with the Minuteman Project Division. An inert LGM-30A Minuteman I missile was processed along with 90% of its support equipment in the spring of 1960. Another inert missile, equipped with electrical components to test the facility's electronic compatibility, was assembled and tested at the Cape in October and November 1960. Last-minute construction, equipment installation and launch pad preparations also required an around-the-clock effort from Boeing toward the end of 1960 to get the facility ready for the first Minuteman I launch from Launch Pad 31 on 1 February 1961. The flight was highly successful, and it set a record for being the first launch operation in which all stages of a multi-staged missile were tested on the very first test flight of an R&D program. First USAF crew flight occurred on the 27th of June 1963. Successes alternated with failures when the second and fourth Minuteman I missiles were destroyed during their flights from Pad 31 and Silo 32 on the 19th of May and the 30th of August 1961. But two other Minuteman flights were launched from Silo 32 and Silo 31 before the end of 1961, and they met most of the test objectives. Apart from one flight failure in April 1962, Boeing had a string of five successful flights from Silo 31 between 5 January and 9 March 1962, and the Cape recorded four more successful test flights from Silo 32 in May and June 1962. The latter included the first all-military launch of a Minuteman I missile on 29 June. After a bad start, test results in the last half of 1962 were also somewhat mixed. Two Minuteman I test missiles destroyed themselves during test flights in July and August 1962, and another Minuteman I had to be destroyed by the range safety officer approximately eight seconds after launch on 17 October. Five successful test flights were recorded in September, November and December 1962, and the year's operations were capped by a partially successful flight from Silo 32 on 20 December, while Minuteman I launches continued at Cape Canaveral. Other aspects of the Minuteman program advanced elsewhere in the United States. On 28 September 1962, for example, a Minuteman I missile was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base for the first time in that base's history. The first Minuteman I Model A flight of 10 missiles was placed on alert at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana on 27 October 1962, and the first full squadron of 50 Minuteman I missiles was on alert at Malmstrom by the spring of 1963. By July 1964, 600 Minuteman I missiles were dispersed in hardened underground launch facilities at 12 operational missile squadrons in the western United States LGM 30B Minuteman IB. Technological improvements in the Minuteman had already outdistanced its deployment by that time, and the Secretary of Defense approved a program in November 1963 to gradually replace the entire Minuteman I A, and B force with more powerful Minuteman II missiles. The first LGM-30B Minuteman IB missiles went on alert at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota in July 1963, and Ellsworth's 66th Strategic Missile Squadron was declared operational less than three months later. LGM-30F Minuteman II on 2 October 1963, shortly after the first Model A and B Minuteman I squadrons achieved operational status, Headquarters USAF issued Annex A to Specific Operational Requirement 171 which established a requirement for the Minuteman II ICBM Model F. A more advanced missile than either model of the Minuteman I, the F model incorporated a new, larger second stage, improved guidance system, a greater range and payload capacity, and an increased capability to survive the effects of nuclear blast. Facilities were reconfigured for the Minuteman II program during the last half of 1964, and the operations branch launched the first Minuteman II test missile from Silo 32 on 24 September. Three additional highly successful Minuteman II flights were launched from Cape Canaveral before the end of 1964, and they were followed by a string of seven near-perfect test flights from Silos 31 and 32 in 1965. 
The operations branch launched four Minuteman II test missiles in 1966, and it launched four more in 1967. The final Minuteman II was launched from the Cape on 6 February 1968. LGM 30G Minuteman III Operations Branch successfully launched the first Minuteman III test missile from Silo 32 on 16 August 1968. That fight was followed by nine other test flights from Silo 32 and Silo 31 between 24 October 1968 and 13 March 1970 though four of those later Minuteman III fights failed to meet their test objectives, the operations branch wrapped up the Minuteman III R&D flight test program with three highly successful flights from Silo 32 between 3 April and 28 May 1970. Though three more Minuteman III missiles were launched from Silo 32 on 16 September 2 and 14 December 1970, they were launched by Boeing for the Special Test Missile STM, project, a post-R&D effort to evaluate the Minuteman III's performance and accuracy. Following the final Minuteman III launch on 14 December, the Minuteman Test Division continued to reduce its numbers, and only a handful of personnel were retained to complete the disposition of Minuteman equipment after the division was deactivated on 31 December 1970. The remaining personnel were reassigned to other duties, and the last of the Minuteman contractors departed in 1971. The 6,555 THS role in ballistic missile development ended with the Minuteman III flight test program in 1970, but Minuteman and Titan missile tests continued under SAC and the 6,595th Aerospace Test Wing at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Topic. Space launch operations The Air Force's interest in artificial satellites—and hence, space operations—was sparked by discussions with the Navy shortly after the end of World War II. At Major General Curtis E. LeMay's request, the Douglas Aircraft Company's RAND Group provided the Pentagon with a 321-page study in May 1946 on the feasibility of satellites for military reconnaissance, weather surveillance, communications and missile navigation. The Soviets' successful launch of Sputnik I on 4 October 1957 came as a shock to the American public, but the military implications of that capability came into even sharper focus as much heavier payloads were all orbited from the Soviet Union in the months and years that followed. Galvanized into action by the Soviet Union's achievements, the U.S. Department of Defense set high priorities on the development of military satellite systems. It also created the Advanced Research Projects Agency on 7 February 1958 to supervise all U.S. military space efforts. The Air Force drew up a manned military space system development plan in April 1958, and it also volunteered to carry out the U.S. Man in Space mission. Though much of the plan was incorporated in later manned space efforts e.g., Project Mercury, Project Gemini and Project Apollo, President Dwight Eisenhower rejected the Air Force's offer to lead the effort. Instead, he called on Congress to establish a civilian space agency, and the National Aeronautics and Space Act was passed by Congress in July 1958. Since the Air Research and Development Command was destined to serve the Air Force and two non Air Force clients in space, i.e., ARPA and NASA, effective coordination among the agencies was crucial to the early success of the space mission. Before the 6,555th absorbed the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division's resources at the Cape in December 1959, most of the Air Force's participation in the Cape's space launch operations was managed by the WS-315A project division under the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division's Assistant Commander for Missile Tests. The WS-315A Project Division was redesignated the Space Project Division on 16 November 1959, and it became the Space Projects Division under the 6,555th Test Wing on 15 February 1960. Following the establishment of Air Force Systems Command, the 6,555th's Test Directorate and Operations Directorate were transformed into the Space Program's Office and the Ballistic Missiles Office on 17 April 1961. 
Under that reorganization, the old Atlas Project Office's resources were divided roughly in half to create an Atlas Booster Branch and an Atlas Weapons Branch. The Atlas Booster Branch was placed under the Space Program's office. The old Atlas Operations Division became the new Atlas Weapons Branch's operations section, and the new Atlas Weapons Branch was placed under the Ballistic Missiles Office. The Space Projects Division became the Space Projects Branch under the Space Programs Office on the 17th of April, and its Thor Booster Branch, created on the 17th of March 1961, was removed and set up as a separate branch under the Space Programs Office. Topic: <laughs> Thor Able 1958 to 1961. The division had jurisdiction over Complex 17 and 3 missile assembly buildings, e.g. hangars M, L and AA. It supported a total of 10 Air Force-sponsored Thor Able, Thor Able I and Thor Able II space launches from Pad 17A before the end of 1959. The division also supported NASA's Pioneer 1 and Pioneer 2 missions, which were launched by Douglas from Pad 17A on the 11th of October and the 8th of November 1958, and NASA's Explorer 6 mission, which was launched by Douglas from Pad 17A on the 7th of August 1959. Under the 6,555th Test Wing development, the Space Projects Division managed five Thor Able Star missions for the Army, the Navy, and ARPA in 1960. It also monitored Douglas preparation and launch of two Thor Able boosters for NASA's Pioneer 5 deep space mission to Venus in March 1960 and its TROS-1 weather satellite mission in April 1960. Topic Atlas, Atlas Agena, Atlas Centaur, Atlas Project Mercury 1959 to 1965, 1961 proved to be a very busy year for the 6555th and its space launch contractors. Following its first two unmanned Project Mercury capsule launches for NASA in September 1959, Big Joe 1, and July 1960, Mercury Atlas 1, Convair launched Atlas D boosters on three successful, and one unsuccessful. Project Mercury flights from Complex 14 in 1961, Mercury Atlas 2, Mercury Atlas 3, Mercury Atlas 4. The Douglas Aircraft Company launched three transit navigation satellite missions from Pad 17B for the U.S. Navy, and it provided booster support for two Project Explorer missions and one TROS mission, TROS-3, that were launched from Pad 17A in 1961. Aeronutronic and the Blue Scout Branches Operations Section launched a total of six space vehicles from Pads 18A and 18B in 1961. NASA Associate Administrator Robert C. Siemens Jr. signed a joint NASA-ARDC agreement on 30 January 1961 concerning the Air Force's participation in the Room 81 Agena B launch vehicle program, and the 6,555th's participation in the Centaur program was settled with NASA under a joint memorandum of agreement in April 1961. The Air Force Ballistic Missile Division procured the Atlas boosters required by the program, and it provided operational, administrative and technical support for those launch vehicles. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Goddard Space Flight Center provided the spacecraft. The Launch Operations Directorate's Test Support Office acted as NASA's formal point of contact for all agencies involved in the Agena B program on the Eastern Test Range, but the 6,555th was responsible for supervising the Air Force contractors who provided the boosters for the Agena B. While many tests were observed jointly by NASA and Air Force representatives, NASA was responsible for the spacecraft, Lockheed was responsible for the Agena B, Convair was responsible for the Atlas D booster, and the 6555th was responsible for the readiness of the entire launch vehicle. Ultimately, NASA's operations and test director had overall responsibility for the countdown, but he received direct inputs from the 6,555th's test controller concerning the vehicle's status on launch day. The 6,555th was also allowed to assign Air Force supervisors to Convair's processing teams while they were working on Atlas D boosters for the Atlas Centaur R&D test flights. In instances where NASA's Launch Operations Directorate wanted procedures added to Convair's Atlas D checklists, the 6,555th integrated those items. 
NASA also agreed to coordinate Centaur test documentation with the 6,555th. To avoid duplication of effort, NASA and the Air Force agreed to share a large number of facilities, e.g., Complex 36 and Hangars H, J, and K, for the Centaur, Agena B, and Project Mercury efforts. Since NASA planned to use the Centaur's facilities first, the Air Force secured a promise from NASA to coordinate its Centaur facility and equipment modifications with the 6,555th before the changes were made. The 6,555th agreed to make an officer available as a consultant to NASA's launch director during Atlas Centaur launch operations. In 1962, Air Force contractors and the Atlas Space Branch supported three Ranger program and two Mariner program missions from Complex 12, and they supported the first three manned orbital Mercury Atlas missions, which were launched from Complex 14. All those NASA missions were launched by contractors, but the Air Force implemented plans in the last half of 1962 to establish an Atlas Agena BUSAF launch capability. The division's Project Mercury support mission ended following the last Mercury flight in May 1963, Mercury Atlas 9, but the unit still supported DOD operations on Complex 13. It picked up Atlas Agena B target vehicle operations for Project Gemini shortly thereafter. Topic: Titan II, Thor Titan, Titan Project Gemini, 1961 to 1966. Thor Titan branch formed in 1961 by redesignation of Thor Booster Branch. On the 10th of September 1962, the wing established the SLVV division to handle the Titan III program separately, and it transferred Titan III personnel from the Thor Titan branch to the new division before renaming it the SLVV X-20 division on the 1st of October 1962. The Thor Titan branch became the SLV-2 IV division on the 1st of October 1962, but it was split up to form two new divisions: the SLV-2 division for Thor and the Project Gemini Launch Vehicle division for Titan-2 on the 20th of May 1963. Though Complex 17 supported seven other NASA missions in 1964 and 1965, the two-part asset aerothermodynamic elastic structural systems environmental tests program quickly became the SLV-2 division's principal interest after the first project asset launch on the 18th of September 1963. Under one part of the asset flight test program at the Cape, the second, third, and sixth hypervelocity vehicles were launched from Pad 17B on the 24th of March 1964, the 22nd of July 1964, and the 23rd of February 1965. Those flights were designed to gather data on the ability of materials and structures to handle the pressures and temperatures of atmospheric reentry. Though the flight on 24 March failed to meet its test objectives due to a malfunction in the Thor rocket's upper stage, the other two flights were successful, and the vehicle launched on of July was recovered. Under the other part of the asset flight testing, two non-recoverable Delta Wing glide vehicles were launched from Pad 17B on 27 October and 8 December 1964. Both missions were designed to obtain data on panel flutter under high heating conditions and information of the vehicle's unsteady aerodynamics over a broad range of hypersonic speeds. Both flights were successful, and the final asset flight on 23 February 1965 completed the asset program. The Air Force had no further use for Thor rocket facilities at Cape Canaveral after the asset program was completed, so the Space Systems Division directed the 6,555th to turn over its SLV 2 facilities to NASA for the civilian agency's Thor Delta 19 German Marks program. In accordance with Air Force Eastern Test Range procedures, the 6,555th returned the facilities to the range in April 1965, and the Air Force Eastern Test Range transferred them to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in May 1965. The 6,555th's Titan Gemini Division lasted considerably longer than its SLV-2 division. The division exercised technical test control over the Titan II GLV launch vehicle, but the Martin Company launched the booster. 
Martin launched the first unmanned Gemini Titan GLV mission from Complex 19 on 8 April 1964, and the flight succeeded in placing an unmanned 7,000-pound Gemini 1 capsule into low Earth orbit on that date. The first manned Gemini mission Gemini 3, was launched from Complex 19 on 23 March 1965, and it met all of its test objectives. Astronauts Virgil I. Grissom and John W. Young were recovered with their capsule in the primary recovery area after three orbits on March 23 d. Nine more pairs of astronauts were boosted into orbit aboard Gemini Titan GLV launch vehicles in 1965 and 1966, and seven Atlas Agena target vehicles were launched from Complex Complex 14 in support of six Project Gemini missions. Following the last highly successful Gemini Titan GLV flight in November 1966, the Gemini Launch Vehicle Division completed its mission and began transferring personnel to other Air Force bases or to other agencies under the 6,555th Aerospace Test Wing. As overall manager for Project Gemini, NASA was understandably proud of its role in the highly successful effort, but the Air Force and its contractors planned, built and launched all the Titan II GLV space boosters associated with Project Gemini. Topic: <laughs> Titan IIIA C 1961-1982 NASA's plans for the Saturn Heavy Lift rocket program were already underway in 1961, and the agency saw no need for a military heavyweight space booster for low Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit or deep space missions. Consequently, NASA resisted the Air Force's first attempts to secure funding for the Titan III initiative, and the Air Force had to work long and hard to prepare its case for the Titan III. It was decided that the Titan III would be developed exclusively for Department of Defense heavy lift orbital missions after 1965. Following that concession, initial funding for the Titan III contractual effort was granted on the 11th of December 1961, and Space Systems Division's new 624A Systems Program Office began managing the Titan III program four days later. Initially the Titan III was planned for use in the X-20 Dinosaur manned space glider which could be boosted into orbit, maneuvered, and piloted back to Earth. Plans for the program called for two unmanned and eight manned Titan IIIC spaceflights with manned glider landings at Edwards Air Force Base. At Secretary Manamara's request, it was stopped by President Lyndon B. Johnson in December 1963 before any spaceflights were flown, though Titan III Complex 41 extended across the Cape Canaveral boundary into NASA's territory on Merritt Island, all property within Complex 41's security fence and along the access road to the site was considered part of the Air Force's Titan III program. Put simply, NASA had jurisdiction over the Merritt Island launch area, the Saturn rocket program and Saturn rocket facilities on Merritt Island and Cape Canaveral. The Air Force had jurisdiction over Cape Canaveral, the Titan III program and all Titan III facilities, including Complex 41. Though the Air Force Eastern Test Range and its contractors continued to provide range support for all of NASA's launch vehicle programs on Merritt Island and Cape Canaveral, the Saturn rocket and Titan III rocket programs were pursued as distinctly separate NASA and Air Force launch efforts. Martin launched the first Titan IIIA from Complex 20 on 1 September 1964, and three more Titan IIIA flights were completed before the first Titan IIIC was launched from Complex 40 on a successful mission on 18 June 1965. Following the fourth and final Titan IIIA launch on 6 May 1965, Complex 20 was deactivated and returned to the Air Force Eastern Test Range in September 1965. Complex 41 was turned over to the Titan III Division's Operations Branch for beneficial occupancy on 18 June 1965, and the facility was accepted by the Air Force in December 1965. The first Titan IIIC lifted off Pad 41 on 21 December. The flight met most of its test objectives, including the successful release of the LES-3 and LES-4 communications satellites and the Oscar IV amateur radio satellite. Two more Titan IIIC missions were launched from Complex 41 on 16 June and 26 August 1966. 
The first of those flights included the successful release of seven initial Defense Communications Satellite Program satellites and one gravity gradient satellite, but the second flight ended after the Titan IIIC's payload fairing broke up approximately 79 seconds after launch. Eight IDCSP satellites were destroyed in the mishap. Another Titan IIIC was launched from Complex 40 on the 3rd of November 1966, and it boosted a modified Gemini 2 spacecraft and three secondary satellites into orbit during a largely successful experimental mission on that date. Since the Air Force intended to use Complex 40 for its manned orbiting laboratory (MOL) flights, the MOL was cancelled in June 1969. Complex 41 eventually supported all the Titan IIIC missions launched from the Cape between the beginning of 1967 and the end of the decade. It was used by Titan IIIC rockets for a Project Viking simulator mission and a Project Helios solar mission in 1974, two NASA Project Viking, Viking 1, Viking 2 missions to Mars in 1975, another Project Helios mission in 1976, and two NASA Voyager program, Voyager 1, Voyager 2 missions to the outer planets in 1977. A defense support program, DSP mission had just been launched from Complex 40 on the 6th of November. 1970, but the payload failed to achieve proper orbit. The spacecraft's operational potential was reduced as a result. The next Titan IIIC vehicle and its DSP payload were assembled and checked out for a launch on 5 May 1971. The launch on 5 May was successful, and the payload was placed in a synchronous Earth orbit as planned. That flight marked the 16th Titan IIIC mission in the 6,555th Test Group's history. On the 2nd of November 1971, the Air Force and its contractors launched the first two Phase II Defense Satellite Communications Program (DSCP) satellites into near-synchronous equatorial orbits from Complex 40. That Titan IIIC mission was successful, and it marked the first in a series of classified flights destined to replace Phase I DSCP satellites that had been launched from the Cape between 16 June 1966 and 14 June 1968. On 1 March 1972, a Titan IIIC carrying a 1,800-pound DSP satellite was launched successfully from Complex 40. Eight days later, a Titan IIIC core vehicle C-24 arrived via C-5A Galaxy aircraft, and it was erected at the VIB on 16 March 1972. It was launched successfully on 12 June 1973. Titan IIIC launches continued throughout the 1970s when launch vehicle C-37 and a twin DSCS payload. The launch CST was run on 12 November 1979. Regarding the launch itself, there was one unscheduled five-minute hold during C-37's launch countdown on 20 November. The countdown resumed without further incident, and the Titan IIIC lifted off Complex 40 on 20 at 2110.00 Eastern Standard Time. Both Phase II DSCS communications satellites were placed in their proper near-synchronous orbits, and the mission was a complete success. The last vehicle launched under the Titan IIIC program was Launch Vehicle C-38. It arrived at the Cape on 24 October 1979, and it was the last of 36 Titan IIICs launched from the Cape between 18 June 1965 and the evening of 6 March 1982. After two years of testing, storage and retesting, C-38 was launched on a classified mission on 6 March 1982 at 14.25.00 Eastern Standard Time. The flight marked the end of an era at the Cape Complex 41 was refurbished for the Titan IV program during the last half of the 1980s, but its first Titan IV launch did not take place until 14 June 1989 almost 12 years after it was used to launch the Voyager program missions to the outer planets. Topic: <laughs> Titan 34D 1980 to 1989. As the last Titan IIIC thundered skyward, Martin Marietta and the test group were completing their second year of preparations for the Titan 34D's first launch. 
The effort began in earnest when the first Titan 34D Corps vehicle arrived at the Cape in March 1980. Baseline CSTs were completed in September 1980, and, apart from a brief round-trip ride to the SMAB on of November, the Corps vehicle remained in storage at the VIB until 18 May 1981. The Corps vehicle was accepted in August 1981, and it was moved to the SMAB on 18 January 1982. The Titan 34D's operational IUS IUS-2 arrived at the Cape on the 22nd of December 1981. It was taken to the SMAB and its assembly was completed there on the 8th of June 1982. Though the IUS pre-planned acceptance testing was completed on the 19th of August, its formal acceptance was delayed pending additional tests required by Space Division. The IUS was mated to the launch vehicle on 1 September 1982, and it was mated to the vehicle's DSCS-2-3 payload on 29 September. Acceptance testing was completed on 2 October, and the vehicle was prepared for launch. Launch vehicle D-01's first launch CST was aborted on 20 October 1982, but its second launch CST was completed successfully on 21 October. The countdown was picked up smoothly on the 29th of October at 2055Z Greenwich Mean Time and the first Titan 34D lifted off complex 40 at 0405-01Z on the 30th of October 1982. The Titan's flight was virtually flawless and the IUS placed both DSCS satellites into near perfect equatorial orbits. With the completion of this first highly successful launch operation, the Cape moved solidly into the Titan 34D era. All Titan 34D launch operations at Vandenberg and the Cape were suspended following the Titan 34D 9 launch failure in April 1986, but it would be wrong to conclude that the suspension allowed the 6,555th Aerospace Test Group and the Air Force's Titan contractors to lapse into a period of inactivity. On the contrary, the Space Launch Recovery Effort and Titan IV program initiatives kept the test group's agenda full. The test group supervised the initial recovery effort at the Cape. As part of that program, a non-destructive testing X-ray facility was constructed in the ITL area for the purpose of inspecting Titan solid rockets for flaws in propellant, restrictors, insulation and podding compounds. Construction of the NDT facility began on 1 October 1986, and solid rocket motor testing was conducted there as part of the Titan 34D recovery effort from 23 December 1986 through 12 June 1987. The last Titan 34D launched from the Cape had an extensive processing history between the time it first arrived at the Cape e.g., 19 August 1981 and the time it was erected for the final time on transporter No. 3 in cell No. 1 on 13 December 1988. The transstage was erected on the core vehicle on 28 March 1989. The acceptance CST was completed successfully on 23 June 1989. Core vehicle D2 was moved to the SMAB for solid rocket mating on 2 July, and launch vehicle D2 was moved out to Complex 40 on 5 July 1989. The vehicle was mated to a classified payload and prepared for launch. Though the first launch CST failed on 21 August, the launch CST on 27 August was completely successful. A Borky mobile service tower delayed pre-launch activities on 4 September, but a 22-minute long user hold brought operations up to speed at T-30 minutes. After the countdown resumed at 0524Z, it proceeded without incident to vehicle lift-off at 0554-01Z on 4 September 1989. Titan IV As Titan 34D launch operations continued, the first Titan IV liquid rocket engines were installed on the Titan IV Pathfinder vehicle at the end of January 1988, shortly before the core vehicle was erected in the VIB. Four Titan IV solid rocket motor segments were received at the SMAB by the middle of February 1988, and two electrical functional tests were conducted in early March. As bugs 
were worked out of various systems. The core vehicle had its first successful CST on the 11th of May 1988. The vehicle was moved to the SMAB around the middle of May. Following a successful mate with two five-segment stacks of solid rocket motor segments, the Pathfinder vehicle was moved out to Complex 41 on Saturday, the 21st of May. The first Titan IV vehicle supported a classified mission. Its launch had been scheduled for the 7th of June 1989, but the lift-off was pushed to the 14th of June due to a range timing generator problem and a computer malfunction. The countdown was picked up at 0254Z on the 14th of June. Two unscheduled holds were called to let the launch team catch up on checklist items that were behind schedule, and another hold was called for a high temperature reading on the vehicle's S-band transmitter. Following the last unscheduled hold, the countdown proceeded uneventfully, and the Titan IV lifted off Complex 41 at 1318.01Z on 14 June 1989. Navstar Global Positioning System and Development of the Delta II 1978 The Navstar Global Positioning System GPS program opened up a whole new field for space support operations at the Cape in the 1980s, the launching of satellites to provide highly accurate three-dimensional ground, sea and air navigation. The U.S. Navy and Air Force began the effort in the early 1960s with a series of studies and experiments dealing with the feasibility of using satellite-generated radio signals to improve the effectiveness of military navigation. After 10 years of extensive research, the services concluded that Defense Department requirements would be best served by a single, highly precise, satellite-based global positioning system GPS. In December 1973, the Defense Navigation Satellite System, later known as Navstar GPS, entered its concept validation phase. The technology necessary to field the GPS was confirmed during that phase, and four advanced development model Block I Navstar satellites were launched on converted SM-65F Atlas boosters from Vandenberg's Space Launch Complex 3 East between the 22nd of February and the 11th of December 1978. Two more Block I satellites Navstar 5 and Navstar 6 were launched on converted SM-65F Atlas boosters from Vandenberg Complex 3 East on 9 February and 26 April 1980. By the end of 1980, the Navstar GPS constellation was arranged in two orbital planes of three satellites each, orbiting Earth at an altitude of approximately 10,900 nautical miles. Following the GPS development phase in the early 1980s, the Air Force planned to procure and deploy a constellation of 24 Block II GPS satellites via Space Shuttle launches by the end of 1987. Funding cuts in 1980 and 1981 reduced the planned constellation to 18 Block II satellites and added a year to their deployment, but the program continued to move ahead. A Block I replenishment satellite was launched on a converted SM 65E Atlas booster from Vandenberg Complex 3 East on 18 December 1981. Unfortunately, a hot gas generator on one of the Atlas booster's main engines failed shortly after lift-off, and the vehicle crashed about 150 yards from the pad. The next replenishment satellite launch was postponed while Atlas engines were refurbished and test-fired in 1982, but the mission was finally launched successfully from Vandenberg Complex 3 West on 14 July 1983. The satellite Navstar 8 replaced Navstar I in the 240-degree orbital plane of the GPS constellation. The last three Block I satellite missions Navstars 9, 10 and 11 were launched on converted SM-65E Atlas boosters from Complex 3 West on 13 June 1984, 8 September 1984 and 8 October 1985. All three launches were successful, and the satellites performed as planned. Testing of the first Block II satellite was well underway in 1985, but the Navstar II satellite program was already markedly behind schedule. 
By the fall of 1985, the first Block II mission had to be rescheduled from October 1986 to January 1987. Following the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster in January 1986, the GPS program office replanned the first eight Block II satellites for flights on the new Delta II expendable medium launch vehicle in lieu of the Space Shuttle. Space Division awarded the medium launch vehicle MLV contract to McDonnell Douglas Astronautics Company on the 21st of January. 1987. However, unlike earlier commercial arrangements, the company would no longer be under contract to NASA. Under the new commercial expendable launch vehicle program encouraged by President Ronald Reagan since 1983, McDonnell Douglas would be responsible for producing, marketing and launching its commercial Delta IIs. The Air Force would be responsible for ensuring safety and environmental standards for commercial as well as military launches, but McDonnell Douglas would have greater responsibility in meeting those standards including quality control. Both launch pads 17A and 17B would be equipped to handle commercial and defense department missions. McDonnell Douglas and its subcontractors were soon hard at work preparing the pads for the new Delta II vehicles. Like the Titan and Atlas lines of launch vehicles, the Delta II line was built on major components supplied by several different contractors. McDonnell Douglas built the basic core vehicle and supplied fairing materials at its plant in Huntington Beach, California, but it shipped them to another plant in Pueblo, Colorado for further assembly and or matchups with other contractors' components. Rocketdyne provided the Delta's main engine, and Aerojet supplied the vehicle's second stage engine. Delco supplied the inertial guidance system, and Morton Theocol built the strap on solid rocket motors used for the basic Model 6925 Delta II vehicle. The first and second stages were transported to the Horizontal Processing Facility HPF in Area 55 for destruct system installation. Following processing at the HPF, both stages were moved to Complex 17 and erected. At Complex 17, the entire process came together to create a complete Delta II launch vehicle. Unfortunately, trouble loomed from a different quarter in July 1988. McDonnell Douglas ran into trouble getting some fiber optic equipment it ordered for Pad 17A, and the first Delta II launch was rescheduled from the 13th of October 1988 to the 8th of December 1988. Following additional delays and pre-launch tests, the countdown was begun on 12 February 1989, but it was scrubbed at 1827Z due to excessive high-altitude winds. The countdown was picked up again on 14 February, and liftoff was recorded at 1829-59, 988Z on 14 February 1989. The first Delta II placed the first Navstar II GPS payload into the proper transfer orbit. The mission was a success. Following the first Navstar II GPS mission on the 14th of February 1989, the GPS program office hoped to have five Navstar II satellites in orbit by the end of September, but only three of those spacecraft had been launched by that time. Since 12 Block II satellites would be needed to give the GPS constellation its first worldwide two-dimensional navigation capability, planners estimated that capability could not be achieved before the spring of 1991. In point of fact, six more Navstar II satellites were launched over the next year. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in August 1990 provided additional incentive for McDonnell Douglas and the Air Force to rise to the challenge. Navstar E9, the last of the six Navstars mentioned, lifted off on the 1st of October 1990 and it was placed in orbit over the Middle East. The satellite's on-orbit testing program was completed in record time and Navstar E9 was turned over to Air Force Space Command on the 24th of October 1990. Navstar E10 was launched successfully on the 26th of November 1990. With E-10 in operation, the GPS network provided two-dimensional coordinates with an average accuracy of 4.5 meters during Operation Desert Storm. The Navstar system's three-dimensional accuracy averaged 8.3 meters during the war. The GPS program office hoped to launch five Block IIA Navstar spacecraft by October 1991, but component problems associated with the new design caused lengthy delays. Only two Block IIA missions were launched by October 1991, but five more Block IIA launches were completed by the end of 1992. 
The constellation was well on its way to full operational status by the beginning of 1993. Topic: <laughs> Space Shuttle military missions. The 6555th Aerospace Test Group established its Space Transportation System (STS) division on the 1st of July 1974. The division was created to ensure that Defense Department requirements were included in plans for future Space Shuttle operations at the NASA Kennedy Space Center KSC. As two of its earliest accomplishments, the division got NASA to agree to the Defense Department's requirement for vertical payload installations at the Shuttle Launch Pad and a secure conference area in the firing room of the Shuttle Launch Control Center LCC. The division continued to serve as an intermediary between KSC and the Defense Department payload community. The division not only gave the payload community a better understanding of schedule and contractual constraints affecting KSC ground operations, it also gathered a more detailed set of requirements from military payload programs to help NASA support those programs. The division also helped the 6595th Space Test Group develop requirements for a shuttle launch processing system at Vandenberg Air Force Base. The division also provided selection criteria and background information to help the Space and Missile Systems Organization select its shuttle payload integration contractor. Martin Marietta was awarded the shuttle payload integration contract on 15 September 1977. As preparations for military space shuttle operations continued, the STS division identified and analyzed many problems associated with factory to pad processing of military payloads. The division's findings helped justify the need for an offline shuttle payload integration facility SPIF, and they convinced the AFSC commander to approve the SMAB's Westbay as the site for the SPIF in January 1979. As work on the SPIF got underway, the 6555th Aerospace Test Group formed the STS IUS Site Activation Team in September 1981 to address problems associated with the first IUS processed aboard the shuttle. The STS Division and the Satellite Systems Division were consolidated to form the Spacecraft Division on 1 November 1983. The first military space shuttle mission, STS 4, was launched from Pad 39A at 1500Z on 27 June 1982. Military space missions also accounted for part or all of 14 out of 37 shuttle flights launched from the Cape between August 1984 and July 1992. While many details of those missions are not releasable, some features of shuttle payload ground processing operations and range support requirements can be summarized for what might be termed a typical military space mission. One process common to many military shuttle missions was the preparation of the inertial upper stage IUS. Though the ultimate destination of the IUS was mission specific, the IUS was processed in one of two basic assembly checkout flows, i.e., one for military payloads and the other for NASA spacecraft. Before either process began, the inertial upper stages structural assemblies, avionics, and flight batteries were received at hangars E and H and placed in various storage areas at the Cape. At the appropriate time, all vehicle elements were transferred to the SMAB, where they were assembled and checked out. Following power-up checks and functional testing, the military IUS was cleaned and transferred to the SPIF. For civilian missions, IUSs entered a different assembly, checkout flow at this point in the process. They were sent directly to NASA's vertical processing facility on Merritt Island. STS-4 OV-102 Columbia, the 27th of June to the 4th of July 1982. While details concerning the nature of the first shuttle DOD payload remain classified, we may note that it arrived at the Cape in April 1982. It was processed by an Air Force NASA contractor team, and it was loaded aboard the shuttle Columbia as the vehicle stood on Pad 39A. Following an 87-hour countdown, Columbia lifted off at 1500.00Z on 27 June 1982. 
Navy Captain Thomas K. Mattingly, II and Air Force Colonel Henry W. Hartsfield, Jr. conducted the military mission in addition to several civilian experiments while on orbit, and the long-term effects of temperature changes on shuttle subsystems were studied along with a survey of orbiter-induced contamination in the shuttle's payload bay. Columbia made a hard runway landing at Edwards Air Force Base at 1609.00Z on 4 July 1982, STS-41DOV-103 Discovery the 30th of August to the 5th of September 1984 the first of five operational SYNCOMIV military communications satellites was launched on Discovery's maiden flight on 30 August 1984. The flight supported a mixed DOD, civilian mission, and Discovery's on-orbit agenda included the deployment of two civilian satellites e.g., AT&T's Telstar 3C and Satellite Business Systems SBSD and a Solar Array Experiment OST-1, STS-51A OV-103 Discovery 8-16 November 1984 Mission 51A was Discovery's second voyage into space, and it featured a military spacecraft among its payloads. The lift-off was scheduled for 7 November 1984, but upper-level wind shear delayed the launch until 8 November. Discovery was launched from Pad 39A at 12.15.00 Z on 8 November 1984. The ANIKD-2 satellite was deployed successfully at 2104Z on 9 November, and the military payload SYNCOMIV was deployed successfully at 1256Z on 10 November. The rendezvous and satellite capture sequences were completed successfully over the next four days in space, and Discovery landed at KSC's shuttle landing facility at 1200.01Z on 16 November 1984, STS-51COV-103 Discovery 24-27 January 1985 The first all-military shuttle mission was originally scheduled for launch on 8 December 1984, it did not lift off until 24 January 1985. Captain Thomas K. Mattingly, too was selected to command Discovery on the highly classified mission. The launch was delayed on 23 January due to weather, and cold weather held up cryogenic fueling operations for two hours on 24. Those delays aside, the last four hours of the countdown proceeded smoothly, and Discovery lifted off Pad 39A at 1950.00Z on 24 January 1985. Details of the mission are not releasable, it is believed that a Magnum-1 reconnaissance satellite was released using an inertial upper stage solid-fueled booster rocket. Discovery landed at KSC at 2123-24Z on 27 January 1985 STS-51DOV-103 Discovery 12-19 April 1985 The 3rd SYNCOMIV spacecraft was deployed along with Telesat Canada's Annex C satellite during Discovery's mission in mid-April 1985. Discovery lifted off Pad 39A at 1359.05Z on 12 April 1985. Discovery's crew deployed the Annex C satellite successfully on the first day of the mission, and the SYNCOMIV was deployed on day two. Unfortunately, the SYNCOMIV's perigee kit motor failed to fire, and two more days were added to the mission to allow a rendezvous and an improvised restart of the spacecraft. Two flyswatter devices were attached to the shuttle's remote manipulating system RMS to allow the crew to depress the SYNCOMIV's timer switch. Despite a successful rendezvous and a switch reset on day 6, the attempt failed. The SYNCOMIV spacecraft was left in orbit to be retrieved and redeployed in early September 1985. Discovery landed at KSC's shuttle landing facility at 1,355 to 37 Z on the 19th of April 1985. STS-51IOV-103 Discovery, the 27th of August to the 3rd of September 1985. Discovery's sixth trip into space was launched in late August 1985. The countdown was started again at 0205Z on 27 August, and it proceeded smoothly except for a three-minute extension in a built-in hold to clear traffic in a solid rocket booster retrieval area. Discovery lifted off Pad 39A at 1058.01Z on 27 August 1985. 
The OSSAT-1 spacecraft was ejected from the orbiter's cargo bay at 1733Z on the 27th, and the satellite's deployment and perigee kick motor burns were both successful. The ASC-1 deployment and boost were also successful on day one of the mission. The SYNCOMIV-4 deployment went extremely well on day three, and Discovery's crew prepared for their rendezvous with the wayward SYNCOMIV-3 spacecraft on day five. The spacecraft was retrieved and repairs were completed on the satellite on day 6 of the mission. SYNCOMIV-3 was redeployed at 1512Z on 1 September 1985. Unlike its earlier performance in April, the spacecraft began sending good telemetry data to ground stations shortly thereafter. Discovery landed on Edwards Runway 23 at 1315Z on 3 September 1985, STS-51J OV-104 Atlantis 3-7 October 1985 The shuttle Atlantis maiden flight was completed in early October 1985, and it was dedicated to a highly classified military mission. Atlantis was launched from Pad 39A at 1515-30Z on 3 October 1985. Details of the mission remain classified. It is believed that two DSCS 3B4 and DSCS 3B5 were launched using an IUS booster from the shuttle. Atlantis landed on Edwards Runway 23 at 1700Z on 7 October, STS 27OV 104 Atlantis 2 7 December 1988. The shuttle's next military mission was put on hold after the Challenger disaster, but it was carried out by Atlantis between 2 and 7 December 1988. The mission was highly classified, so most details are not releasable. Though the countdown was picked up at 0230Z on 1 December, upper-level wind shear effects delayed the launch until 2 December. The countdown was picked up again on 2 December, but a problem with a ground-feed liquid oxygen valve required a 50-minute unscheduled hold at T-180 minutes. Wind shear problems forced another delay at T-9 minutes for an additional 99 minutes, but the final unscheduled hold at T-31 seconds only lasted 71 seconds. Atlantis lifted off pad 39B at 1430-34Z on 2 December. The shuttle landed at Edwards Air Force Base at 2336-11Z on 6 December 1988, STS-28OV-102 Columbia 8-13 August 1989 Columbia was pressed into service to support her second military space mission in August 1989. Once again, the mission was highly classified, so only a few details are releasable. The countdown got underway on 8 August 1989. A user data link problem delayed the countdown for approximately 70 minutes during a built-in hold, but the count proceeded normally after that incident. Columbia lifted off pad 39B at 12.37.00 on 8 August 1989. In addition to deploying their military payload successfully, Columbia's crew conducted several on-orbit experiments during the five-day mission. The shuttle landed on Edwards Runway 22 at 1337Z on 13 August 1989, STS-33OV-103 Discovery 23-28 November 1989 Discovery was launched on her second all-military shuttle mission in late November 1989. The countdown on 23 November proceeded uneventfully until T-5 minutes, when a 3-minute and 30-second hold was called to let the user complete checklist items. The countdown resumed, and Discovery lifted off pad 39B at 0023-30Z on 23 November 1989. It is believed that a Magnum 2 reconnaissance satellite was released using an inertial upper stage solid-fueled booster rocket. Though Discovery's landing was delayed until 27 November due to high winds over Edwards Air Force Base, the shuttle made a successful landing on runway 4 at 0030Z on 28 November 1989. STS 32OV 102 Columbia 9 to 20 January 1990, Columbia's ninth space mission was a mixed military, civilian operation. 
The mission had three main objectives, 1 deploy the 5th SYNCOMIV military satellite, 2 retrieve the Long Duration Exposure Facility LDEF deployed by the Shuttle Challenger in early April 1984, and 3 conduct a variety of experiments in the Shuttle's MIDIC area. A launch attempt on 8 January 1990 was scrubbed due to weather, but the countdown on 9 January proceeded smoothly, and Columbia was launched from Complex 39A at 12.35.00 on 9 January 1990. The SYNCOMIV-5 spacecraft was deployed successfully at 1318Z on 10 January, and Columbia rendezvoused with the LDEF on 12 January. All MIDIC experiments were underway by the end of day two of the mission. Though the shuttle's landing was delayed a day for weather, Columbia landed safely on Edwards Runway 22 at 0935-38Z on 20 January 1990, STS-36OV-104 Atlantis the 28th of February to the 4th of March 1990 Atlantis lifted off Pad 39A on another all-military shuttle mission at 0750-22Z on 28 February 1990. Though details of the mission remain classified, the flight was successful. Atlantis landed on Edwards Runway 23 at 1808 to 44 Z on the 4th of March 1990. STS-38 OV-103 Discovery, 15 to 20 November 1990. Atlantis flew another all-military shuttle mission in November 1990. The launch was originally planned for the summer of 1990, but it was delayed after hydrogen leaks were found in the Atlantis and Columbia orbiters. Atlantis was rolled back to the VAB for repair toward the end of July 1990. A new mission execution order 90 to 7 was implemented on the 21st of October 1990, and it announced a tentative launch date of the 10th of November 1990. The countdown was picked up on 15 November at 1340Z, and it proceeded smoothly to a built-in hold at T-9 minutes. That hold was extended 2 minutes and 34 seconds to allow the user to catch up on checklist items, and the countdown proceeded to lift off at 2348-15Z on 15 November 1990. The mission was highly classified, so on-orbit details are not releasable. It is believed that a Magnum 3 reconnaissance satellite was released using an inertial upper stage solid fuel booster rocket. Atlantis crew planned to land at Edwards Air Force Base on 19 November, but strong winds delayed the landing and forced NASA to divert the orbiter to KSC's shuttle landing facility instead. Atlantis landed on KSC runway 33 at 2142 to 43Z on the 20th of November 1990. STS-39OV-103 Discovery, the 28th of April to May 1991. Discovery's SDI mission featured two deployable payloads, three orbiter bay payloads, and two MIDIC experiments. The Infrared Background Signature Survey IBSS was on board to help define SDI systems and gather infrared data on shuttle exhaust plumes, earthlime and aurora phenomena, chemical, gas releases and celestial infrared sources. It consisted of two deployable hardware elements e.g., the Shuttle Pallet Satellite 2 and a collection of three chemical release observation sub-satellites and a non-deployable critical ionization velocity element. The Air Force Program 675 payload was included on the mission to gather infrared, ultraviolet and X-ray data on auroral, earthlime and celestial sources. It consisted of five experiments mounted on a pallet in the shuttle payload bay. The Space Test Payload 1 STP1 was a secondary payload consisting of five experiments designed to gather data on, 1 fluid management in weightless conditions, 2 MILVAX computer and erasable optical disc performance in weightless conditions, 3 atomic oxygen glow effects, 4 free particles present in the shuttle payload bay during flight ascent and 5 the upper atmosphere's composition. The cloud logic to optimize use of defense systems clouds experiment used a 36 exposure camera to photograph clouds and correlate cloud characteristics with their impact on the efficiency of military surveillance systems. The handheld radiation monitoring equipment 3 RME3 sensor was included on the mission in one of a continuing series of experiments to collect data on gamma radiation aboard the shuttle with discovery safely in low earth orbit the crew set about completing the mission 
The SPARS-2 was deployed at 0928Z on 1 May 1991. Though problems with the onboard sun sensor forced cancellation of the first exhaust plume observation, other observations went well later in the day. NASA was reportedly very pleased with the results. The AFP 675 payloads experiments went well, and 31 of 33 individual experiments were completed by the time the shuttle's remote manipulating system retrieved the SPARS-2 at 1445Z on 3 May. Following another day of Earth observations, the SPARS-2 was returned to the payload bay and stowed. Discovery's deorbit burn occurred around 1750Z on 6 May, and the shuttle landed at KSC's runway 15 at 1855Z on the same day, STS-44 OV-104 Atlantis, 24 November to 1 December 1991, the last military shuttle mission was flown by Atlantis. The mission execution order 91 was implemented on of October 1991, but the scheduled launch was delayed for five days in mid-November due to a problem with the payload's IUS. A handful of optics, communications and weather instrumentation problems also cropped up during the countdown on 24 November, and the range safety display system required a reload approximately half an hour before launch. Despite those problems, Atlantis liftoff from Pad 39A went smoothly at 2344.00Z on 24 November 1991. The primary objective of the mission was to deploy a Defense Support Program DSP, satellite approximately 6 hours and 18 minutes into the flight. The crew deployed the DSP spacecraft as scheduled at 0603Z on 25 November, but the mission was terminated three days early due to an inertial measurement unit failure aboard the shuttle. Though a landing at KSC was scheduled, Atlantis was ultimately diverted to Edwards Air Force Base for her landing. Following completion of the deorbit burn at 2131Z, Atlantis touched down on runway 05 at 2234-42Z on 1 December 1991. Lineage Designated as the 6555th Guided Missile Group Test and Experimentation and organized on the 15th of August 1959 redesignated 6555th Test Wing Developmental on the 21st of December 1959 redesignated 6555th Aerospace Test Wing on the 25th of October 1961 Redesignated 6,555th Aerospace Test Group on the 1st of April 1970. Inactivated on the 1st of July 1992. Topic: Assignments. Air Force Missile Test Center, the 15th of August 1959. Ballistic Missile Division, the 21st of December 1959. Space and Missiles System Organization, the 25th of October 1961. Space and Missile Test Center, the 1st of April 1970. Eastern Space and Missile Center, the 1st of October 1979 to the 1st of July 1992. Topic: Stations. Patrick Air Force Base, Florida, the 15th of August 1959 to the 1st of July 1992. Topic. See also. List of United States Air Force Tactical Missile Squadrons.